All right, this one is a ZV457MG9. Normally they're 427MG9s. Uh, it's a pretty basic unit, DVD recorder, VHS hi-fi stereo made by Magnavox, actually sourced by Funai Symphonic. And the difference is on this one, it has a built-in standard definition tuner, which means it receives digital signals off of the air and converts them to SDTV. Right off the bat, I'm suspecting high ESR capacitors based on what this customer is saying. Steve, thanks again in advance for repairing this unit for me. The problem with the unit is when plugged in, the power button, light, clock, and source button all flash in sync with each other. From research, I've done this is caused by a power surge. I don't know for sure if this is what happened, but when turned on, the unit one day to use it and this is how it was. I have watched numerous videos on YouTube of you fixing units like this and know that you will clean it but if that is not normal for you I would like it cleaned and the mode switch looked at while you are in there. I like what you do and the knowledge that it takes to repair these instead of just sending them on to the landfill. Thank you very much. Let me know when this arrives and leaves if you can. The remote is included. No batteries. Wasn't sure about shipping with them. Thanks again. Okay, let's go ahead and get into this guy. See what's inside. Okay, here we are inside. And as you can see, everything looks almost identical to the other ZV-427s that I have repaired. With the exception of they didn't have this board right here. This is the ATSC tuner and decoder board that allows reception of high definition signals and converting them to standard definition signals. So you don't need an over the air tuner to receive high definition digital broadcasts on this unit. So even before I plug this in, I'm going to go ahead and pull the DVD mechanism out so I can get to the power supply which is located below the DVD mechanism and we'll just do a quick visual inspection on the power supply board and just see if we see any bad capacitors at all. What do I see right there? A little bit of capacitor leakage. Anytime you see a capacitor that has a domed top you can bet that capacitor has high ESR. The top on that capacitor is not flat. If you look at all the rest of the capacitors on here, they are perfectly flat. This one, however, has definitely got a bulge to the top of it. Look at that right there. There it is. So chances are this 4700 microfarad capacitor is the problem with this unit. Now I'm going to go ahead and since this has a capacitor problem, I'm going to go ahead and do not, like I normally do and unsolder the positive lead of every capacitor on this board and go ahead and do an ESR check just to make sure everything is okay. So let's get the board out of this unit and we'll check all these caps and find out what's good and what's not. Okay, so here's the capacitor that is bad in the circuit. A 4700 microfarad 6.3 volt capacitor. Now here's the reason I ask you if you're going to do an ESR check to unsolder the positive lead of all of the capacitors. So if this capacitor is bad and I just do a simple ESR check across this, it's going to check good because look at this. There's a 15 microhenry coil and a 1000 microfarad capacitor to ground and a 47 microhenry coil 
and a 470 microfarad capacitor to ground. So if I don't unsolder, I'm going to unsolder this lead, this lead, and this lead because these capacitors still being in circuit with an inductance can certainly skew the results of the ESR meter right here. Alright, so I've got the positive lead unsoldered of all the capacitors like I normally do. And let's just go ahead and check them. Zero, pretty good. Zero. 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 Mm, just under zero. It's probably a low value cap. Zero. Zero. Ooh, two ohms. I wonder what the value is on that one. Oh, that's a small little guy. That's a 10 at 50. That one's perfectly fine for 2 ohms. That's absolutely good for a 2 ohm. Here is C1017. That's the one that we suspect is being bad. 1 ohm. That is definitely bad for a 4700 microfarad capacitor. Well, let's go ahead and pop a new one in there. And then we'll actually fire the unit up and see if we get better results. Okay, so I've determined that the 4700 at 6.3 is in fact defective. The problem is I don't have any 4700s at 6.3 in stock. I do have a nice Nichicon 3300 and another nice Nichicon 1500. They're both at 10 volts. So what I'm gonna do, you see this unpopulated pad right here? It's in parallel with the 4700. I'm gonna go ahead and add the 3300 and the 1500. But the problem is the capacitors I have are actually taller than the original factory capacitors. So that does pose a problem because the DVD unit sits just millimeters above this capacitor. So if I make it taller, it's not going to work. So what I'm going to have to do is lay this capacitor down sideways right here and once this is laid down I can lay this capacitor down sideways right here. I've done it before it works perfectly fine and ultimately the customer is going to get some much much higher quality 105 degree Celsius rated capacitors over these cheap Chinesium caps that are in here right now. So let's go ahead and put those in. We'll put the board back in the unit. We'll fire the unit back up and the customer asked me to go ahead and clean the mode select switch as well as cleaning the tape path and I'll service the DVD optical pickup as well. All right, all caps replaced. It's back together. Power on. So it's trying to read the DVD. I have it in the VCR mode. Let's put a tape in it and see if it plays. It takes the tape. It does load the tape. and it's playing the tape. And I have a monitor set up and it is actually playing the tape. That's great. So the customer asked that I go ahead and service the VCR unit as well as the DVD unit. And we'll go ahead and clean the mode select switch because that's a big problem in these units. A big, big problem. So let's get the tape out. Next, we have to tear this thing all the way apart because I have to get the circuit board and the mechanism completely out of the chassis under here. And then I have to loosen the mechanism so that I can lift it up enough to gain access to the mode select switch, which is like right in this area here. So let's go ahead and pull this thing all the way apart. Okay, so one of my YouTube followers commented that it is indeed possible to clean the mode select switch on these units without having to unsolder this ribbon cable. And yes, it is. So, you need to take this screw out right here. And then very, very carefully flip the cable back. And you'll see there's a screw right there. Okay. Got those two out. Now keep in mind, those are different screws. This one on this side is sheet metal. 
this one on this side is plastic. So pay particular attention to the thread style putting this in. This is a machine thread screw and this is a coarse thread for plastic. Once you've got that apart, very carefully flip the unit back over and now you can actually lift the unit up to gain access to the mode select switch right there. So now once it's up, I kind of put my hand in here just like this. So I'm supporting the circuit board and I'm lifting up on the mechanism at the same time. And just go ahead and lift up and pop the cover off the mode select switch. There's the wipers. You'll want to clean those. And then there is the mode select switch. So there is what it looks like before we go ahead and clean it. I see a lot of oxidation in there. Does not look good, especially back here in this area. I know it's kind of hard to see. It's at a really weird angle. But, I mean, just look at all the oxidation, especially on these pins, all the way in the back. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom out. And I'm going to get my stainless toothbrush. Hopefully it'll stay in focus. I'm just going to go ahead and scrub this guy. Okay, there it is after I've got it all scrubbed with my stainless steel toothbrush. Next, I'm going to go ahead and get a cotton swab. I'm going to moisten it with acetone and go ahead and clean off any contaminants that I may have left behind. Then I'm going to go ahead and add some silicon dialectic grease to this as well as clean the rotary contacts on the rotary portion, the movable portion. And then we'll put it back together. We'll work it a few times to get the grease to settle in. Then we'll put it all back together. I've got a cotton swab moistened with some acetone. You do not have to worry about melting the plastic. This type of plastic does not melt with acetone. I'm going to go ahead and clean any of the contaminants I may have introduced into the switch while I scrubbed it with a stainless toothbrush. Next I'll get some dielectric grease. I just want to make sure everything is coated with silicon dielectric grease. That prevents any oxidation in the future. That looks good. Then I'm going to very gently swipe these contacts. In one direction only. They look really good. Next, I'll go ahead and place this back, snap it into position, and I'm going to rotate it several times in both directions. All right, last, I'm going to line this up perfectly straight. There's actually a mark on the circuit board. It's hard to see, but there's a circle right there. I'm just going to line that up with the circle. And that's going to index with the rotary gear on the mechanism when I put it back together. Okay, got it back together. I'm going to put my two screws back in. Remember on this one, be extremely careful. Mode select switch is cleaned without having to unsolder the ribbon cable whatsoever. So once again, thank you for the commenter that suggested that I can clean this without having to disassemble the ribbon cables because these actually are a big pain in the butt to try to unsolder and resolder and keep them in a perfect state as well as this one over here. That was not too bad, so I got two pins. Okay, so I have most of the unit reassembled. Let's go ahead and check some capacitors right now. First, let's verify lead integrity so we get an accurate reading. 
That's a 47. It measures 4 ohms. That one is bad. 330, 1 ohm, bad. 330, half an ohm, yeah, I'd like it to see closer to zero. 47, 6 ohms, bad. 330, half an ohm, bad. 330, half an ohm, bad. Uh, 330, quarter of an ohm, I'm going to say that one's okay. 330, 1 ohm, bad. 330, quarter of an ohm, I'm going to say that's okay. 47, 7 ohms, bad. 100, 3 ohms, bad. 100, 3 ohms, bad. 100, half an ohm, it's marginal. I'll let that one slide. 47, 4 and a half ohms, bad. 330, half an ohm, I'm going to say that one's bad. 330, half an ohm, eh, marginal, but I'll say it's bad. I'll replace it if the customer wants me to. Quarter ohm, I'm going to say that one's okay. That's a 330. 47, 5 and a half ohms, bad. 47, 5 and a half ohms, bad. 47, 6 ohms, bad. So what I'm looking for in these capacitors is I want to see a 100 microfarad capacitor with, with less than half an ohm ESR. This one I said was okay. It's right at half an ohm, just barely okay. This is a 100. It's got three ohms, definitely bad. Now, when we get up into the 330s, I like to see a quarter ohm. That one is right at a quarter ohm. This one, one ohm. I'm going to call it bad. So I have a certain criteria that I look for. I think I'm going to estimate to this customer to replace every capacitor on this board just to be safe. Because I don't want any comebacks. And since there's only realistically one, two, three, four good capacitors out of 20, this will probably work okay as a DVD player, but I would not trust it whatsoever if I'm going to try to use it as a DVD recorder. Okay, so next I'll do a quick VCR service. Okay, the VCR tape path is completely cleaned. And yes, I did use acetone, like I have been using since the early 80s. Almost 40 years I've been doing VCR service and using acetone and regular cotton swabs to clean video heads. VHS, Beta, 8mm, Umatic, Betacam, it doesn't matter. I've always used cotton swabs. People tell me you can't use cotton swabs because it's going to damage the enamel, which is the gold on the wires right here. No, it's not. It does not eat the enamel. And if you're careful, you can actually clean video heads with a cotton swab. You need to make sure that when you're cleaning these, you clean it in a horizontal motion only. And when I clean the heads, I use this area of the cotton swab, not out here where it's loose. I, lo I use it back here where it's very tightly wrapped to actually wipe the heads themselves. Never clean in a vertical or an up and down motion on the heads. Next we'll go ahead and we'll clean the infrared emitter diode which is underneath this prism. We'll take the prism loose, we'll clean the receiver diode underneath this gear. As this rotates, it makes and breaks the infrared beam so it knows the tape is actually moving. We'll go ahead and clean the supply infrared diode, which you can see over here on this board right here. The take-up infrared diode, these are receivers. The only emitter is in the center right here. So that's a receiver, that is a receiver, and that is the receiver. So let's go ahead and take out the single screw. We'll clean the emitter, the receiver, and we'll wipe off the faces of the receiver over here and the receiver over here.
screws out. This is the prism assembly. It's loose. We'll go ahead and clean the entrance to the prism assembly, the exit of the prism assembly, and we'll go ahead and wipe off the two sides of the prism assembly as well. So this is one place where you cannot use acetone. You have to use glass cleaner in a cotton swab. And now I'm going to go ahead and remove some of the cotton swab which makes it easier to get down in here because the diameter of this hole here is too small for a full size cotton swab to get through. But look at that. A smaller cotton swab actually gets through with no problem at all. We'll go ahead and wipe off the face of the supply sensor and I'll wipe off the face of the take up sensor as well. There we go. All good. Next with my moist end I'm going to go ahead and wipe off the entrance to the prism and the exit for the real rotation. I'll dry it once again. All good to go. Now I'll put the screw back in it. Okay, VCR servicing is done. Let's go ahead and clean the optical pickup now. For that, I'm over here on the DVD unit. I'm going to take out these three screws. Unplug these two ribbon cables. If you have a 457 unit, you have to unplug this power supply cable as well. Don't forget to remove the screw on the back of the unit right here for the HDMI connector also. Now, when servicing this unit, I recommend that you do not ever unplug this connector right here. This is the laser optical pickup for the DVD unit. They are very static sensitive. And unless you've already provided the solder bridge on the optical pickup, you want to keep this plugged in because this has anti-static properties built into the circuit board so you don't damage the laser diode. So I always try to leave this connector plugged in. I'm just going to go ahead and take the board and fold it back over with the connectors plugged in. Next I'm going to go ahead and just Unclip these four clips. That allows this cover to just be taken off and pulled out. Now I can get to the optical pickup, which is right here. We can go ahead and move the pickup out of the way so we can gain access. Let me zoom in on it. Okay, here is the optical pickup. I've got a flashlight on it. This one is actually really clean. I wonder if the customer already cleaned it. I would not expect to see this, this status. I did, however, see that the dust on this has been disturbed. So I think my customer may have already been into this unit, but we'll go ahead and give it a cleaning nevertheless. So I've got a fresh cotton swab moistened with glass cleaner. It's not soaked, it's just moistened. I don't want it to overly saturate this lens. I just want to go ahead and clean it in a circular motion. And then with the dry end, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to dry it in a circular motion. And there it is, all done. Let's put the flashlight back on it. Yeah, definitely cleaner than when we started. Okay, let's put this thing back together now. Give it a final test. All right, here we go, VHS tape in. Hit play. And let's shoot over to the monitor. All right, there is the VHS playing. It looks absolutely perfect. Let's go ahead and do a fast forward search. That looks great. Back to play. All right, let's go ahead and put a DVD in it now and see if the DVD player actually plays. Hit loaded, I'll hit play. All right, there it is, up and playing. Oh my gosh, look at that. That's been like 40 plus years ago. So it works great. The VHS works. The DVD does play. That's my room when I was younger. Oh my goodness. Let me know if you recognize anything in this room. 
So once again, I want to give my sincere thank you to those who have supported my channel with a donation via PayPal or by having me repair your unit like this one. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to my channel and liking this video. It really does help my channel grow. You can follow me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at NorCal715. You can email me norcal715videos at gmail.com. Go ahead, leave me a question, a comment, a concern down below. I try to respond when I have time. Remember, with your help, we can try to keep these things out of the landfill, out of the recycle bin, and out of the e-waste facility. Everybody, have a great day. Once again, thank you so much for watching this video. I really do appreciate it. Bye-bye. So as you can see, there's two Allen set screws right here. Those are the factory height adjustments for the double azimuth head down here. There's one Allen set screw. You can see some thread lock on it. That's the hi-fi head. That Allen set screw is the height adjustment for the hi-fi head to make sure it tracks correctly. Over here we've got two more Allen set screws. Those set the height of the double azimuth head. And by double azimuth, I mean there's an SP head and an EP head. They're opposed in their directions. The SP head is a positive 6 degrees. The EP head is a negative 6 degrees. The hi-fi head over here has, I think, about a 25 degree azimuth. And so all the tracks are written, if you write the SP head at 58 microns, which these really aren't. These are actually more like a 48 micron SP head and a 19 micron EP head, a 25 micron hi-fi head. They actually write over the top of each other, and because the azimuth, the angle of the head is such a diverse angle, you can actually record multiple tracks on top of each other. So that's how the SP, EP, and Hi-Fi heads actually work. Now the reason they put these two heads so close together, they're only a few horizontal lines apart. If you look at them down here, it's really hard to see, but they're only a couple of horizontal lines apart. This spins at 1800 RPM, and so the distance from here to here is 180 degrees. That's one horizontal frame of video on your TV set. The video frame is consisted of 525 horizontal lines for NTSC video. Now once you get into a high definition that's a completely different story. You've got 720p and 1080 which is 1920 by 1080. 720 is 720 by 1280. So this is not compatible with high definition. It's only standard definition. I hope you enjoyed this quick little tutorial on how NTSC video works.